is up, people. I'm Garrett Johnson, and you're listening to Consider Before Consuming, a podcast by Fight the New Drug. As those of you who are familiar with Fight the New Drug know, we act as a as an aggregate, sharing science, research, and personal accounts to help others make informed decisions about pornography. On this episode, we sit down with Libby, and she shares her own personal account on being married to someone who suffered with an addiction to pornography. Libby's experience is unique to her and her circumstances, and she's chosen to share her experiences um, with the hope of helping other people learn from her experience. Fight the New Drug would like to note that we continually encourage couples and individuals who are experiencing the impacts of pornography in their relationships to make decisions that are best for them and their situations. Sometimes that means they choose to go their separate ways, and sometimes that means that they choose to stay together and support each other through the struggles that porn brings. It all depends on the individuals, the relationships, and their unique situations. And we respect the decisions that people make for themselves. If you're a person who has been impacted by the harmful effects of pornography and or other forms of sexual exploitation, we encourage you to seek help when needed and do what is best for you and your unique situation. During our conversation with Libby, she displays some raw emotion, which is understandable due to the trauma that she experienced. Listener discretion is advised. Please note that Libby is a pseudonym used to honor her desire to remain anonymous. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Consider Before Consuming. We want to welcome to the podcast, Libby. Libby, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Garrett. You're welcome. Thanks for being here. Um, We know each other a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. But not very well. Yeah. How many hours do you think we've actually interacted? Like, <laughs> I'm just trying to give our audience an idea of how. I feel like probably two, two hours. Yeah. yeah, total. Total. Right? Yes. We first met in D.C. Yeah. So that was cool. Yeah, very cool. And now we are, where are we? We are in the jungles of Guatemala. <laughs> That's kind of a weird thing to realize, actually, because... Yeah. We've only known each other for, I mean, we've only interacted for like a total of two hours, but we've been in two cool parts of the world. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah. Well, how did that happen? I guess we should give our audience a little bit of like background. Why were we in D.C.? Why are we here? Yeah. Why were you in D.C. like a month ago? Well, I mean, in general, we were there for the um, Coalition to End Sexual Exploitation Summit, um, which was amazing and very, very cool. And I was going just because I wanted to kind of meet other fighters and kind of get more involved and find my place in the fight. And I knew I was going to Guatemala with Fight the New Drug because I had already signed up for the trip. And so I was really excited to meet you guys and see if anyone was going. (laughs) That's cool. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, and we were there, the coalition as well, the end sexual exploitation, because that's right in line with our mission statement. Um. I remember when you came up and said hi to us Mm -hmm. at the booth and you're like, you're like, I'm doing this and this and this and I've done this and this and this. (laughs) And it was cool to see kind of your passion for the movement for for love and for ending sexual exploitation. And so I thought that was cool. Yeah. Um, Yeah. the, The goal of the podcast is to talk about the harmful effects of pornography and also kind of help people consider consider a life free from pornography okay um using science facts and personal accounts um well jumping into kind of your personal account Mm -hmm. i think a lot of people will benefit from hearing your experience Mm -hmm. we want you to share as much or as little as you want yeah but i think that the the the, uh, some of the stuff you've told me I think that a lot of our listeners will feel catharsis and, and they'll be benefited from hearing it. Um, can you talk to your personal account a little bit? Your personal experience as to kind of why you're passionate about 
fighting for um, fighting for love and ending sexual exploitation. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, gosh, let me think about where to start because it's such a multifaceted thing for me. Um, well, I guess the easiest place to start is my marriage because I feel like it's probably the most tangible thing for most people. Um, so, well, before my marriage, I guess I already kind of had a bit of, um, a drive to end sexual exploitation. Um, and I hadn't had any really personal experiences or encounters or anything. Um, but it had always just been on my heart. Yeah. Um, I ended up getting married at 22. Um, and two years into the marriage, my husband, after some prodding, (laughs) came to me and, um, told me that he had an addiction to pornography. Um, and so when you were asking him questions, you mentioned like with a little bit of prodding is yeah. that you used, um, and he told you about his challenge with pornography. Yeah. Um, what was what was your response to that? Your initial like <laughs> oh my gosh in the moment response. Literally, well, let me tell you a story. <laughs> the first time he told me, so the build up to give you a little background was um, he was um, in a band and he was on a national tour with them for. I don't remember, maybe three or four months. And he'd only been gone for probably about a month, I think. And I had started having really, really, really bad, like, anxiety attacks and, like, just really struggling with depression, which I've kind of always had a little struggle with depression, but this was, like, very different. Um, And I was at home by myself in L.A., and I... um, I I think we were texting one night actually and I just kept pushing him and I was like uh like something is wrong like I know something is wrong you, like tell me like what's going on and I started asking him really weird specific questions about um like girls on the tour and like what his habits were while he was on tour and little things kept coming out. He was like, oh, you know, giving me little details here and there. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, I did this. Oh, okay, okay, I did this. But nothing really major came out. It's like you're you're getting a vibe that something's up. Yeah. Like, just something in my gut was, like, just wrong. Like, very, un- more than uneasy. Like, uneasy is an understatement. I was borderline suicidal. Like, something in my soul was, like, breaking and I didn't know why because everything was fine you know it appeared to be fine yeah interesting so I told him look I'm going to Seattle tomorrow because I was doing hair in Seattle I was, I'm going to Seattle tomorrow you need to meet me like I'm I can't do this anymore I need to have this conversation yeah we need to have this conversation face to face like and so he did he flew to Seattle we met we actually went to go see our premarital counselor just for one session and um saw him I don't really remember the session at all but then the next morning I was we were staying at my parents house I was getting up getting ready to go to have coffee with an old friend and literally I was walking out the bedroom door and he was still sitting in bed and he just sat up and he said hey I need to talk to you and so I kind of turned around and I was like okay what and he was like I think the exact words that came out of his mouth were everything I've told you is a lie and went on to tell me, you know, that he thought he had a pornography addiction and it, I don't remember all the details he gave me in that moment, but basically it was probably five or six minute conversation of just, I have a problem. Everything I've told you is a lie. Everything I said in our session yesterday with our counselor was a lie. I've been covering up all this and et cetera, et cetera. Man. So, and I kind of didn't have a reaction because I was on my way out the door. Were you kind of numb? I was, I was. Emotionally numb? Yeah, because I was shocked, but I was also like not shocked at all. Kind of relieved? Yes, yeah. That the truth came out? Yeah, there was a bit of like, oh, okay, this makes sense now. 
you know, like, of course, not relief in the like, like, of oh, course. thank God my husband has a pornography addiction. Right. But just relief that I'm not crazy. Yeah. I don't so feel true. crazy. I or this is why, why I felt that would crazy. be relieving. Yeah. Interesting. And so. So you're hurt in that moment. Mm -hmm. You're feeling a sense of relief because of the truth coming out. Yeah. Even though it's truth that hurts. Yeah. And it's betrayal and. Yeah. I wonder if you felt some betrayal, but totally. And then also acknowledging his side is like, wow, he told the truth. Yes. And I, I've, I think about this relatively often, but I have always been so grateful for that moment because I didn't have to find out. I didn't have to catch him. I didn't have to find anything. He was able to just on his own, mostly. Yeah come to me and just finally take that weight off of his chest you know one of my favorite quotes that comes to mind as you talk about this is like tell the truth even when it hurts you know yeah. it's like so important for us as individuals and for our relationships interesting yeah so how long did you stay numb for in the sense of like this six minute conversation mm -hmm. yeah you leave mm-hmm and then what was the what was the duration of time where you kind of took a step back to analyze this? Honestly, I don't really remember. Um, not very long because once he told me that, I don't remember if I demanded it or if we decided he was not going back on tour. He quit the band um, and we went back to L.A. to just figure it out. Yeah. To just start working through things so we found um an amazing marriage counselor down there he was very very helpful um, one thing i want to acknowledge is like you guys sought help yeah right oh yeah so much help and you know what's interesting is like i think him telling the truth mm -hmm. was him reaching out to you yeah in a way totally it sounds like based on the way you've explained yeah it. where did you go for help was the therapy your type of was that your yeah. Yeah, really. The the therapy was my my mm. almost like um life jacket. Oh, yes. or like in that analogy? Yeah. Yeah, and I did I had one friend in LA that I really leaned on for a little bit and then um, gosh, if I remember, I think I did go to my parents, maybe not immediately, but they were actually, even though it was an awkward conversation to have or many conversations to have, I did end up really opening up and it totally transformed our relationship. But wow. that was another part or another aspect or another way you reached out for yeah. help. Yeah. Did you feel... Because when someone gets married, there's this, there's, there's this contract, like this social contract. Yeah. And you're both agreeing to treat people and treat the other person with respect. Yep. To love that person, to help that person, to work. Did you feel betrayal oh, when you found out that? Absolutely. Because it's like, it's, unfortunately, because of his situation, like he broke the contract, that social contract. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I felt very lied to and betrayed. Absolutely. Yeah. So you guys start going to counseling and mm -hmm. and all this and I'm trying to trying to think like what advice going back to that initial that initial conversation when he told the truth. Yeah. Would you have done anything differently or do, would you wish that he had done something differently? Because I think some of our listeners will be in a situation where like they, they still haven't told their significant other. Yeah. And then there's going to be some people who just recently found out mm -hmm. that their significant other has a challenge. Yeah. So I would like, if you can, give some advice of like, because your experience is valuable. Yeah. First, starting with him, would you, what do you wish he would have done differently? to tell you about his challenge if i'm being a hundred percent honest nothing i um because of the nature of everything 
Like there's no there's no way he could have told me sooner. Do you know what I mean? Because it was his timing. Well, like yeah. The, those things had to unravel in that way. Y- yeah, I think so. And he he offered that to me, and I have always felt like that really, really was a gift. It's a vulnerable spot for him. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. So no, I honestly wouldn't change anything. Cool. Of course, I mean, it would be nice to know before we got married. <laughs> yeah. If he told you sooner. I guess maybe that is part of the advice. In in regards to an ideal situation. Ideal. Ideally, it would be before you made a commitment. Yeah. Or as soon as you can. Yeah. If you're in a position yeah. where you've already made that commitment, that social right. contract. If it's like, do it now. Now. Immediately. Like, the sooner the better. There is no, there is no too soon. There's no good time. There, no. You're never Now's the be best ready. time. Yeah, absolutely. What about for your side? Looking back, would you, I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty. It's like, <laughs> but it's like, would you have done anything differently? Would you give advice to someone who's going through this? Uh, okay, but here's the thing is that the reactions lasted a really long time. Like that, init- that initial reaction, I wouldn't have changed anything because right. there was no, there really was no emotional reaction. There was no kickback. There was no... How could you, you know, it was just, I can't talk about this right now. Yeah. Um, And the one thing that I want to acknowledge is like when you said like there was no how could you or this or that, some people react that way. And that's, that's them though. Yeah. Like it's, you are an individual and you have your freedom of choice and you can react however you react. (laughs) It's like this new territory. Yes. How are we supposed to know? No. And I, I mean, if I'm being totally honest, so after he did tell me and we went back to LA and we started our marriage counseling, um, we went through a disclosure process where he, with our counselor, he had to, at any time, um, an instance of betrayal, if you will, right. popped into his head, he would have to tell me immediately or write it down and tell me that night. And so that process took basically four months maybe a little more, of Damn almost it. every single day new disclosures. Oh, shoot. The only thing I, the only problem, I mean, I'm not a therapist, <laughs> but I'm just looking at your side. Yeah. And I'm like, shoot. Right. What? That's like some ongoing trauma. Yes. And I and I know that's kind of everyone's reaction to it. And I totally understand that. And I, I, I do obviously agree. Like I feel traumatized still a little bit, but... It, it was so much easier to forgive him when I knew everything. Interesting. I never had to wonder about anything. And when he told me a disclosure, I was supposed to be able to ask any questions I wanted to about oh, cool. the incident. So you get to put him on the hot seat a little bit. Oh, totally. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. So for me, so it leaving, helped you. Uh, it did. It may help some, it may not. Yes. And you kind of decided that with your therapist. Yes. Cool. Yeah. And I would say, do not do this by yourself. Yeah. A disclosure process like that, you need to have professional He, can't, he or she, no matter where, because every situation is unique. Yeah. But... To put that betrayal, to put those circumstances on you, mm-hmm. just between you and him, mm-hmm. that would have been an entirely different thing. Oh my gosh, yes. That wouldn't have been tolerable. No, it would not have been, I don't think it would have been healthy and we wouldn't have known how to handle Manage. it. Yeah, we would not. And process that information. Yes, exactly. And so for us, we were only seeing our counselor once a week, so we would go seven days with new disclosures all week long, and then we would go to see our therapist and process anything that needed to be processed wow well i admire you two because that takes some strength and some patience yeah oh my goodness but again the trauma was real you know i was i was bedridden basically for two months like could hardly get out of bed like not it was not a good place to be and i like though I am grateful for it now and I am grateful for the ability to be able to forgive him and, and walk away from the marriage feeling okay. I, I I would not wish that 
process or pain on anyone, even though I know it, it is necessary for a lot of people. Interesting. Yeah. So you guys are taking, I mean, you're working with a therapist. Yeah. You said it was a process like four months of going through this. Just the disclosure process. Yeah. yeah. Just and then we, we stayed, we were in therapy for about eight months total before we left LA with this particular counselor who is wonderful. Um, and so at this time, are you considering, are you guys moving forward with your relationship? Are you considering divorce? Or are you? I, f- I don't remember specifically, but I know the topic of divorce had come up, of course. Um, but n- we were not really seriously considering it. We, we stayed in LA for those eight months. And then at, at some point we just decided, look, LA is too much for this. Yeah, it's, it's like for you, it wasn't a good place to handle it. No. And for, for me, it was very triggering because all of those instances that he disclosed to me, a lot of them did take place in LA. Yeah. So you like, I have I to would, get a new setting. Yeah. Surroundings. And for him as well, because those triggers were also there for him. So right. it was a very it makes it more challenging. Yeah, exactly. In some ways. So we decided to leave. Um, there were a lot of different options. We were kind of looking at upstate New York for a while, which I don't know why. But we ended up back in the Seattle area, a couple hours north of Seattle, to be kind of close to family, close to our support system, and just kind of in a small town again to kind of try to find our yeah. relationship, find ourselves. Um, and I don't know if I'm jumping ahead, so ask questions if you want yeah. to. But we were home. We bought we bought a condo. So we were definitely on the marriage Still path. Moving forward, yeah. Yes, we were very, we were committed. Um, even though, you know, separation and divorce had been brought up, but we were very not going that direction. Right. And so we bought a condo and we moved up to Bellingham, which is where we were. And I think we were home for about a week. Like we moved home at the beginning of December and it was right around Christmas because we were driving home from our family's houses in Seattle. And we had a very real conversation in the car and we were, I think the words sound really horrible when they come out of my mouth now, but the conversation we had was just very real and very honest and very, very vulnerable. And we had gone through so much together at that point. We had, like, I had gone through so much with him Um, And he had seen me through so much in that disclosure process and through that therapy. At that point, you knew each other on a totally different level. Totally. And the thing for me, when when you say we we knew each other on a totally different level, I would say I was getting to know him for the very first time. Oh, interesting. I never really knew who he was because as we were going through our therapy, we um, were coming up. Uh, well, he, he had qu- quite a big realization of this very, very deep codependence that also kind of um, fed the lies because he wasn't really ever able to voice his own opinion mm-hmm. of what he wanted or needed in any given moment. And so even if we were, let's say, ordering dinner and we were like, what do you want for dinner? Yeah. And if I said, hey, what do you want for dinner? He would never just say, I want pizza. Yeah. He would think in his head, oh, I think she wants Indian, so oh, I really want pizza, but oh, I'm not going to tell her what I want because that's not what she wants. So I'm going to project what she wants and say, let's get Indian. Interesting. So, so I so never... learned that thought process, like yeah. his thought process. Totally. And so I started learning things that he d- did and didn't like, which I honestly had never known that's before. Interesting. So like very deep-seated codependence. Deep. Which, again, was, like, very damaging to our relationship and, ev- I mean, every relationship that yeah. he was in, really. So, through this disclosure process, that was a huge part of it. Um, That's cool. And something I want to touch on for the listeners who might be in this kind of situation, um, especially for the partners, because this... If somebody's going to be going through some sort of disclosure process, whether it's um, facilitated or not, yeah. um, I just want to validate the partner's feelings I- during this process because it's such um, oof, what's the word? Dichotomous? Like, 
I actually don't know that word, and we don't have service on our cell phones, so okay, we're, we're I'm gonna re- use it on our own word then because it might not be the right word. I was word. gonna look it up, and then I realized we're in the middle of the jungle. <laughs> okay, never mind. I'll oh, find yeah. a different word, but like very contrary. Okay, okay, so let me explain what I'm trying to say with many less words. Um, every time a disclosure came out, my husband would say, uh, "This happened. Yeah. I did this at this time. You were here." I would ask all my questions. He would get it off his chest. And 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 in that moment of disclosure, um, you you could almost physically see the difference in his okay. mind and body of like this weight being lifted. Like, oh, you know I don't weird? have to hide this anymore. Oh, man. You know what I just thought of as you would explain that? Mm-hmm. And I don't want this to sound... Um, how do I say it? It's like, it's almost like you were teaching him. I don't want to say this wrong, but like, (laughs) almost like you were raising a child. Oof. And I don't want to, I don't want that to come across as shaming to him. Yeah. And also, I'm sure he taught you things. Oh my gosh. And it goes by both ways, but it's like, almost like we're, we think once we're adults that we're adults and we're good at communication, we're, Hmm. we're healthy and all this, but it's almost like we're still growing. That's what I meant. Yes. Yeah. And I, and I know in my relationship with my wife, it's like, I just, I just recently six months, like four or five months ago had this really big aha moment. And so I look at her and it's like, she's raising a child. Like (laughs) she's helping me, you know? And we, anyway, yeah. Continue. No, I get that. I get that. So you're just saying you want to acknowledge that. Right. Okay. So in this moment of, of disclosure where he's getting this huge weight off his chest yeah. or like a bunch of little weights every mm-hmm. time. Right. And in those moments, you as a partner are having this, this, this. Do you feel like, do you feel like he, cause he, let's use the analogy of a backpack full of little weights. Yeah. And he's taking this weight off, and is he putting it in your backpack? Absolutely, that's exactly what I was gonna say. It was like he's taking this what he, the cinder block off his own shoulders, and he's throwing it Towards at your you. chest. Like it's not even like, oh, here's a weight. Here, it's catch like this expletive, expletive. <laughs> you know, like just like crushing your your heart. You know what I mean? In those moments, even if it's a little thing, it's still f- like that betrayal is so real in that moment. So to him, it's like maybe he's pulling out this little weight. It's like this little mm-hmm. comment or this little idea or yeah. this little betrayal. And he t- it's like it appears to be little. Yeah. Maybe to some people. Right. Then he throws it at you and it's like this. It's a real thing. Yeah. And that hurts. Yeah. And so in and those it's not moments, little. No. And it doesn't feel little. It doesn't feel little. Because it's not little. Really? Yeah. Right. Yeah, totally. But so just that 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 contrast of he's getting better and standing taller and and discovering himself and in that same moment you are taking on weight. Like like crumbling under this mm-hmm. weight that is unbearable. Shoot. Right? And so this is a whole process. Mm-hmm. And like I admire where you're at today. I'm like, shoot. <laughs> Anyway, keep going. Okay. Well, in in the the last little bit of that, like, kind of observation and validation is in those moments, um, the the partner who has been using, if you will, is in this weird place of, um, I don't want to say pride, but kind of pride, you know, like, oh. I'm so proud of myself. I'm finally doing it, which is legit. That's legit. But you as a partner in that moment, you're also kind of supposed to, and really would like to be able to say, honey, I'm so proud of you for for telling me this. Names. Yeah. I, and I, and you want to encourage them because you want everything else to come out. You don't want to shame them. You don't want to, you don't want to, um, deter them from continuing this process and being honest with you and, and learning more about who this person is. But, it's in that moment of being crushed under this weight. Sometimes it's so hard to, to, to play that part, you know, to be able to or, say, I'm proud of you because you're kind of in the moment. You're like, are you fucking kidding me? Right. Excuse me. But, um, and I, again, I'm going to say I was not good at it. Sometimes I was great. Sometimes I was like, well, the thing is you, you don't have to be good at it. No, that's not your job. Right. It's an unrealistic right. expectation. Yeah. You're right. 
So you don't have to be good at it. No. And there was... And I mean, your... The things you were feeling? Mm-hmm. 100% valid. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Yeah. And I... I mean, I would be dishonest if I said there were no, like, screaming or shoe throwing or, right. you know, pushing. And sometimes... Oh, my goodness. I'm so glad you said that because... Those things can be embarrassing because we act that way as humans. Oh, my gosh. I'm still embarrassed at like I have a specific moment in my head of when I I just I lost snapped. It. I lost it. And he told me one thing. And in this moment, again, I'm I'm, try- I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, if I freak out right now, he's never going to tell me anything again. But I oh, literally cannot balance. control myself. Oh, my goodness. And I don't even remember what I threw at him, but I just started screaming and threw something at him. And I was crying and just going psycho, right? Well, not Which psycho. Which is legit. No, I don't think you're going psycho. I think you're going sane. Yes, you're right. You know? No, you, you know are what I'm so right. Thank you. Yes. I think you're going sane. I mean, it's not an ideal situation. Exactly. There is no ideal. Yeah. <laughs> Once you're there. <laughs> That's cool for yeah. you to, to say that. So I just wanted to I just wanted to touch on that because I want. I think a lot of people will feel validated in their so. experience because I mean, like you said, we're dealing with sometimes unhealthy situations and what do you do? Yeah. So from there, you guys buy a condo. Yeah. There's some progression. He's feel, he feels like he's progressing. Mm-hmm. He's throwing weight to you. Yeah. You're carrying that weight. Yeah. But processing through it really well with a very helpful counselor who... So you're still meeting with the counselor? At well, time. we yeah, we were up until like basically the day we left for Seattle. Yeah. No, we were... And then actually when we were in Bellingham, once we moved, we did go see another counselor, but... It's hard to see another counselor after you have like a nugget oh, yeah. of gold. You have to like, and you have to like part of that process is just building a relationship. Yeah. Yeah. So it you was, have to start over again. Yeah. And that wasn't great. It, I think we saw him twice maybe and it was not, it was not a good fit and it was, it was a really difficult thing. But at that point we were not really on the marriage path anymore. How did those conversations start? Was it, was it challenging to consider divorce? For you? Um, Did you feel shamed? Ab- oh my gosh, yes. Like For having those conversations or those thoughts? I didn't feel like shamed because I didn't really tell anyone immediately, but right. I was like anticipating shame. So you repressed shame. those emotions, right? So then you're feeling... Yes, yeah. If you had these thoughts, but you didn't mm-hmm. know how to talk to anyone mm-hmm. about them. Well, and also the thing is, though, there were a f- few mainly in my family but there were a few people who were already throwing the divorce word towards us before we even were you know um that were like maybe it's time to consider this you know maybe maybe this isn't a healthy place for you guys to be um nobody was really like you should get divorced but people who cared about me especially were definitely wary of me staying in the marriage yeah not everyone and especially not like distant friends or acquaintances I've, there were a lot of people who were not supportive right and of course it's not something we wanted and it's not something any of our families wanted and it was uncomfortable um so that that was that was difficult going to our you know our, our so now it's almost like it's almost like now it's your time to tell the truth even though it hurts yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I guess. It really... Was he... Sorry, go ahead. It wasn't that hard to finally say we were getting divorced because for me, there was so much relief Yeah. in finally saying like... We're going to go our separate ways. We're going to go our separate ways. And, and so for me to finally realize like, you know, my life, like my heart and my soul is worth more than keeping this marriage together that is destroying me and really both of us like it's not healthy it's not good so in your experience do you think divorce was healthy for you guys absolutely cool yeah no i have no question about that that's good yeah um fast forward to today how long has it been since you guys got divorced um four years Nice. Ish. Yeah. And do you, we've talked about this a little bit mm-hmm. in our 
two hours of conversation yes. before this <laughs> yeah. conversation. Yeah. But um, you guys stay in contact. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Relatively. We're not like... Best friends. Yeah. But we catch up every few months. Cool. And do you think it's been healthy for him as well? I mean, I the know divorce? we should probably be asking him. Yeah, but right. in your opinion, do you think it was healthy for him as well, the divorce? Um, I hope so. I really, I don't know because I, I don't. At some point, like when we first got divorced, we did talk a lot about um, more intimate things because we were kind of still on this like vulnerable therapy path that we'd been on together for so long. And so when we yeah. got divorced, we still kind of processed the divorce together. We even went to divorce, like divorce recovery classes together. Interesting. <laughs> like, so we continued processing the divorce through afterwards. Um, but um, a couple years into it, I guess, maybe a year into it, I, you know, there's boundaries and, and those boundaries kind of came up naturally. And I don't really want to broach that subject with him. I actually like that a lot because do you know who I talk about her too much? Brene Brown. Okay. One of the things she talks about is boundaries. Mm -hmm. Like part of being vulnerable isn't just that you have to have boundaries. Yeah. That's part of vulnerability. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But also I want to just, before I forget, make sure again, especially for the listeners who are on this path, um, Everybody is different. Like every relationship is different. 100%. And I truly do believe um, sometimes divorce is very necessary and very healthy. And the reason why you believe it, one of the reasons is because you experienced yeah, it. Yeah. Well, my divorce that I'm, I will forever be grateful for. Interesting. Um, but cool. the end, the, the, the kind of cherry on top, if you will, like the end of our marriage story was that we were driving home from Christmas to our new apartment. We had lived there for probably a week to our new condo. And we had this very vulnerable, honest conversation. And what came of it was mom, my ex-husband had had this realization in his own therapy because he was still going to his own individual therapy. And he had had this realization that he, because of the addiction or compulsion and combined with his codependence his whole entire life he realized that he never had loved me had never really loved me and he didn't think he was ever going to be able to love me and then on the same side of that he realized which was probably the most traumatic thing he's ever said to me even on top of all of the disclosures, but he told me that he was never sexually attracted to me and that he didn't think he would ever be able to be sexually attracted to me. And that, I think that was kind of where the, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back of like, okay, then why are, why are we fighting so hard? Because I don't want to be in a marriage that I'm not loved. So that being said though, we did stay married for almost a year after that, after that was said. So that attraction, the lack of attraction mm-hmm. for him, there's millions of people that would find you attractive, you know? Well, thank you. So it's like, I just wonder, we don't know because he's not here, right. but I wonder if porn perpetuated false expectations. I think, um, I think that's the conclusion we came to really was that he didn't think he was ever going to be able to, to be sexually attracted to me because of the amount of of pornography that he had consumed he just wasn't able to see me as attractive he wasn't able to be aroused by me he wasn't able to he wasn't he just wasn't attracted to me you know you know that's interesting because there's science i know we're talking about a personal account right now but there's science and research showing that this can happen because of pornography yeah and I will say, too, because I know, well, a little awkward, but also necessary, because I think a lot of people, like, um, um, will kind of equate that with erectile dysfunction. Yeah. And that was never an issue. So... It was literally just, ec- I guess, expectations and sexual attraction. 
So some people are affected by like a porn-induced erectile dysfunction. Totally. Or porn-induced like arousal disorder. Absolutely, yeah. But you're saying in his case it was more just... I think it's along the same lines, definitely, but it wasn't just like... It was different. Yeah. Well, I think that's sad. Has he ever verbalized regret to you? Because it's... Oh, I wonder in his heart if he feels regret. I mean, he's he's apologized for everything, of course, but... Because one thing that I've learned with my wife, which is very cool, and I had this aha moment, is that I realized that porn, even after three years yeah. of addressing the challenge and moving forward, even three years later, I just realized that porn had perpetuated another false expectation and that's a whole nother story for a different day but it's like i just learned that yeah five months ago (laughs) and i'm so grateful that i learned it yeah because now it's like our relationship's better even better yeah oh that's so good i just wonder if he has some of those moments anyway i hope so (laughs) but again we don't really talk about those things anymore if we do talk which is very rarely now um but if we if we do, I mm, eh, something like that might come up, but right. probably not. Yeah. Just because of the boundaries that we have up at this point. Yep. Which are healthy. Yeah. So how did Fight the New Drug help in this whole thing? Did it help? Um, well, I didn't find Fight the New Drug until later, like much later. And at that point, after everything ended with my marriage and I... Um, I don't know. I I think because my ex-husband handled his recovery and the disclosure process the way that he did, I've just developed a really, really passionate, like, uh, I guess I've developed a passion to help other men however I can, which and women. I don't know how, but yeah, help other, other couples, um, do the same thing one question that just came to mind yeah way off topic but do you know when he first was exposed to pornography um yes i do let me think i think he was 12 interesting Mm. and what year was i i'm just trying to put a timeline to this like what pornography did he have access to at age 12 was he with a cell phone in his pocket at that time no was he looking at like a magazine or vhs he was at a sleepover with a friend and his friend showed it to him. I think he, his dad, his friend's dad had found his dad's stash or something. Okay. And so found it and showed it to him. The reason why I asked that question is because I'm just grateful for conversations that we're having now and trying to change the conversation because it's almost like because if a person is exposed to pornography yeah. before the age of 18, mm-hmm. and, but even into the mid-20s, like when your frontal lobes, getting into the science side of it, it's like the frontal lobes, like the decision-making area hasn't fully developed. Right. You're at a disadvantage Absolutely. for finding true love and true human connection. Yeah. Because you've you've interacted with a counterfeit. Mm-hmm. And yeah. the other thing um, that kind of speaks to our society and the kind of pornification of our society was that a lot of the things he looked at as a young kid was he he would find like swimsuit catalogs if he could like in his neighbor's mailboxes and stuff like that and that's what he would use as his form of pornography right which isn't really pornography he he sought it out yeah he sought it out but it wasn't really he didn't well i just fast forward to today and it's like we have these powerful rectangles in our pocket (sighs) the, the cell phone yeah and it's like 12 year olds today that's why it's so important to have these um, these conversations with yeah. young people because yeah. they need to know what a healthy relationship looks like. And it can't come from like you can't go to pornography yeah. to learn about a healthy relationship. No. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, does does that knowing that he was exposed, does that give you like a little bit of compassion for him exposed at a young age? Like he started to rewire his brain at since oh, 12. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, I think I've felt, even if I was angry or felt betrayed, I still always felt compassion for him because I knew he wasn't really 
I mean, of course, he was in control. Right. But he was making decisions. But yeah, but it's like there's there'd been a gradual process of rewiring the brain. I mean, yeah. just on a scientific level. Yeah, totally. And and he what he was in control, but there was a little bit that was out of control. Yeah. He had never been taught otherwise. Interesting. You know, he had never really had the chance to rewire his brain or wire his brain correctly the first time yeah you know he because it it wasn't really talked about as a kid you know it it was just it was exciting it wasn't it was taboo but it it wasn't talked about it wasn't there were no conversations around it except for shame you know if you see this you're a bad person don't look at this there was no space to talk about it so for young kids, especially in his generation at his age, when he was exposed, there was no one he could really go to and say, look, I have a challenge. I saw this yeah, and I, I don't know this. what to do. Yeah. Well, Libby, and now today you're in Guatemala yes. <laughs> <laughs> with Fight the New Drug. Yes. And we are so grateful that you're here. Thank you. Me too. Like more than I could ever verbalize. Really? So grateful. Yeah. Cool. That gave me the chills a little bit. <laughs> What have you enjoyed most about being in Guatemala with Fight the New Drug? Quite Is there something that stood out? I mean, yes. Aside from the amazing jungle and howling monkeys <laughs> that are around everywhere. Sure. Um, really, I have really, really uh, valued, enjoyed. Again, I don't really think there's like a strong enough word, but I've just really valued the conversations I've been able to have with a few people here and it's just I don't know I feel like it's like a therapy trip (laughs) it is it's so cool (laughs) yeah like just having even a conversation like this or like you know like you and I were able to talk for our little two hours and you know I was able to connect with a couple other people on the trip there's just something really special about this group and this place and this setting not necessarily Guatemala but just this fight the new drug yeah. trip together kind of being here we come out and learn and grow and yeah have fun. and talk vulnerably dude you know like right. talk honestly yeah. and again there's no shame we're just yeah. having this really really important conversation oh my goodness i love it like and uh, i don't know i just think it's priceless it is i hope that because when someone's vulnerable mm-hmm. it strengthens both parties you know yeah and I just want to say thanks to you for sitting down and having a conversation with us on Consider Before Consuming. And I just encourage our listeners to take everything that Libby's talked about and consider them. Yeah. And hopefully, I, I know that many listeners are going to appreciate I wish that we could have some system where they have like a direct line to you and they can call you and be like, hey, thank you so much yeah. for helping me and for telling the truth. And even though it hurt and being vulnerable because you'd get, yeah. you'd have to have like a second cell phone. I mean, but for real, I would, <laughs> I am okay with that. Like if there's cool. ever a, I don't know if anybody ever asks you for someone to talk to just a resource of someone yes. that's like hey i need Even someone to reach out to just a listening ear just someone to talk and validate and and question i don't have answers yeah but i have i have compassion and for both parties and i've been through it and i get it and i would love to talk to anybody who needs someone who's been there cool cuz that's something i did not have yeah and that's something that i think i really want to be able to offer to other people so, hey, if anybody yes. asks you for my number, okay. I give you my permission. It is 735. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Well, Libby, thanks again. My pleasure. Thank you for I having really me. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Consider Before Consuming. Consider Before Consuming is brought to you by Fight the New Drug. Fight the New Drug is a non-religious, non-legislative organization that exists to provide individuals the opportunity to make an informed decision regarding pornography and sexual exploitation using only science, facts, and personal accounts. If you or someone you know struggles with pornography, we invite you to check out our friends at Fortify. 
Fortify is a science-based recovery platform dedicated to helping you find lasting freedom from pornography. Fortify offers a free experience for both teens and adults, allowing you to connect with others in order to better understand your challenge with pornography and track your journey toward recovery. Learn more at ftnd.org forward slash fortify. That's ftnd.org forward slash fortify.